I just feel like doing that tonight. Go to the book of Jude with me, if you will. I'm going to read the whole book tonight. Y'all ready? I mean, the whole thing. Every single chapter. Amen. So I hope y'all are ready to stay a while. We're going to do the whole book tonight. All right. Yeah, I'm just kidding. You know there's only one chapter in Jude. <clears throat> and I was looking back over some of my records. I preached a sermon on the first chapter of Jude, but we're going to begin tonight, and uh, I don't know how many weeks it will take us. It may take us three weeks or, or longer. We'll just see how. I don't want to get bogged down on every single verse if it's not really, um, you know, I don't want to get too bogged down in some of the details of it. And uh, But there... Jude is a powerful, powerful letter, um, and uh, so I want to get into it tonight. We'll probably only get to maybe verse three uh, tonight, or maybe two or three, and uh, but want to try start off. We we'll just do a good introduction of uh, about the book or about the chapter, and um, going to dig into some of it tonight. I think you'll find some of it very interesting, and um, just going to do some teaching tonight. On the on on Jude. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Jude chapter one. Going to read the we'll we, we'll read the whole chapter. Whole excuse me. The whole you know what I mean. Yeah, the whole chapter. Stand with me if you're able, and uh, we'll read it together. Jude, I want you to just pay close attention, especially the first couple of verses here. That's where we're going to dig in and get some of these nuggets out of here tonight. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beast, and those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them! For they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for, for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds and trees that, whose fruit where, where it withereth. Without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, 
The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurs and complainers walking after their own lust. And their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, Praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Pray with me, if you would, before we get into the teaching of his word tonight. Lord, we thank you, God. And I thank you for all that have made the decision to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I pray that some this just eating of your word, the breaking the bread of life, would bring nourishment unto our hearts, Lord. Your word is good. Your word is perfect, and it is like manna from heaven. It is the bread of life. Give it to us tonight. Lord, uh, give us understanding. Give us some insight. And, uh, Lord, that uh, we would be more like you. And, Lord, that we may understand what we read. And we're going to praise you for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. God bless you. Jude is an epistle. An epistle is a letter, a letter that was written uh, by Jude himself. And uh, some things I wanted to share with you just as we're getting started here as an introduction. We are told that he is the brother of James. Um, that's interesting to know because Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, it tells us that Jesus have had some half-brothers. And, um, and one we know is James, who wrote James, and the other is uh, Judas is mentioned in Matthew chapter 13, but Jude is another version or another form of the name Judas. So Jude and Judas are one and the same, depending on the language that is being uh, translated into so it is believed by many that, uh, or most that Jude is the half-brother that is mentioned here. And so we, we know that James and Jude are two of the half-brothers of Jesus. Now, uh, could somebody tell me tonight, why is it that we say that they were half-brothers? Same mother, different father, right? Father was Joseph to some of them, but Jesus... Amen. He was the Son of God. And the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. And so uh, notice there that James nor Jude mentions in their writings that they are half-brothers of Jesus. Now, I, uh, I don't know about you, but I would think that most people uh, would have capitalized on the fact that, hey, man, I grew, up, I grew up with him. You know, if you're trying to add some credibility to your, what you're writing or, or, you know, I, hey, I'm, I'm his half-brother. You would think that they would capitalize on that. We're not really sure why they did not mention that they were half-brothers with Jesus. James introduces himself in the beginning of James. It says, he says, I, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he introduces himself in the beginning of his writing. Jude introduces himself, we just read it, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. And so uh, you would think that they would have capitalized on it, uh, but they did not. Uh, not sure why they didn't, but one school of thought is because they did not believe Jesus to be who he was until after the resurrection. 
uh, the resurrection what was what uh, convicted their hearts. Even though they had grown up with Jesus as their brother, and no doubt they witnessed how he was different than all of the rest and, and, and was around even during the ministry, of course, but they, uh, but they did not mention that they were related at all. Uh, I guess when your brother or your half-brother turns out to be the son of God, uh, an earthly relationship doesn't mean very much at all, right? And so uh, they didn't believe until after the resurrection. And so Jesus' family, not only his brothers, but his whole family, Joseph uh, and even Mary, they all had to come to Jesus for salvation. Even though they, I guess they lived in the same house, they grew up together and all of those things, they still were in need of a Savior. Uh, I didn't realize it, but there was a period of time in church history, early, early on, where there was an idea about Jesus' family as if they were, you know, different than the rest of of, of, of everybody else or every other human being, you know, as if they had some type of special privilege or some type of, you know, uh, uh, like they were the holy family or something, I'm not sure. But, um, but that was a time in, in church history when they looked at the brothers and different things. But every one of them had, they were in need of a Savior just like you and I are in need of a Savior and uh, they had to come to Jesus just like everyone else did in the world, including his mother Mary. Amen. And so I, I know that's kind of touchy ground for some people, in, uh, but God, God chose Mary to be the virgin who would give birth to the Messiah. This was no mistake. God handpicked her, no doubt about it. She was very special. But that doesn't mean Mary was to be lifted up above everyone else on the earth. Uh, did you know, you know, that Mary herself, she confessed that she needed a Savior. You can read that in Luke chapter 1, 46 and 47. Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. And so, uh, you know, one man said it like this. She was blessed among women. She wasn't blessed above women. And so we see the Lord's earthly family not capitalizing on the fact that who they were and how they were related upon this earth, but they were calling themselves servants. They were calling themselves bond slaves to the Lord Jesus Christ. A bond slave is a servant who does not get paid, but is willing to serve who, uh, who their master. They're serving the Lord. In the Bible times, throughout the word, you will hear the, the word servant and bond servant and these things. And this is talking about symbolically being someone who was extremely devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the example here uh, that we see tonight. His own brothers were describing themselves to be such. Well, the book of Jude, de depending on when you where you find it, it was written somewhere between A.D. 65 and A.D. 80. Uh, you'll see some discrepancies there, but somewhere right along in there, though, that about 60 uh, years after Christ, within that first uh, uh, century uh, of the of the early church, that as we get through it, you will find that there he gives an assurance during a, a time when apostasy would come. Throughout Jude, we see that there's an assurance in the days of apostasy. Jude's theme was that the apostasy that would come in the church and on this in this world. Uh, apostasy is an abandonment or a renunciation of a religious belief. And so he's saying there, there's going to come a time in the church where people will renounce 
the truth that we've been taught and we've been we've been preached to. There will be a time where people will abandon the faith of, that they there. And so this is the warning of apostasy uh, that it's it was it was going to come and uh, to be on the watch out of it all. It's like a burglar alarm that Jude is putting on paper here, and he's in uh, he's saying the apostates have broke into the church. You know, like a burglar alarm. Uh, The apostates come in the side door of the church when nobody else was looking. So he was sounding the alarm that they were coming into the church. They were teaching and preaching something different than what the Lord had delivered unto them. And now here we are, what, 1940, 50 years since this book was written and not only, if you know church history, we know that uh, how things went through through the, from the day of Pentecost, through Calvary Day of Pentecost, through the early centuries of the church, through the founding of the Catholic Church, and and, and other branches, other things. And now uh, there's more church, there's more churches uh, in Pahokee than Baskin Robbins got uh, flavors, right? And so, uh, but we know that there has been an abandonment uh, from the Word of God uh, way back, not just now, but definitely even now. We are living in a time where we people have gotten away from what the Word of God says. There's been times in church history where people have went way to the left of what the Word says, right? There's been others that tried to add things to the Word of God and went way way to the right of things and so uh, they have they abandoned there's always been a, a tendency uh, to lean on the flesh in serving God uh, what what I do how many hoops can I jump through that's legalism when you say that you have to do certain things in order to be saved but there's only one way to be saved that is by putting your faith in Jesus Christ amen we have been saved we've been saved to do good works but the works do not save us and so he's sounding the alarm and Jude uh, is, is, is does it in such a dramatic manner it's, it's very good and uh, we'll be getting into that as we go in the next couple of weeks but it's interesting there's a couple of things that is found in Jude that is not found anywhere else in the Bible I found this to be interesting Jude gives the only record in scripture regarding the contention of Satan with Michael the archangel over the body of Moses. That particular record is the only place that he gives us there. We'll get into that in in next week or the week to come. Uh, Jude also records the prophecy of Enoch which is found nowhere else in the scripture. He says and he sees the Lord coming with 10,000 of his saints. This was a prophecy concerning the the, the return of the Lord when Jesus comes to the earth again to establish uh, the uh, the, uh, the in the battle of Armageddon and, and established a millennial reign. May, maybe this is why it's positioned right before as kind of an introduction to Revelation. We're not sure. But Jude begins after his introduction and he gives the he gives who the audience is, who he's writing to. And it's important. Uh, we know that uh, the book of Romans is written to Christians at Rome, right? Those are the Ephesus. Those were the Ephesians. On and on. We get those names, right? They, we apply them to us. But it's important to know who the audience is when you're reading something. Well, he lets us know right off the bat who is the audience here in, uh, in his letter. And he says, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, to, to the sanctified ones, to the ones who have been set apart, to the ones who have been made holy by the blood of Jesus, by the word of God, and by the Holy Spirit. And uh, it, this is so. This is to the church, the, the true church, not, not the lost, 
This letter is not being written to the sinner. This letter is not being, but he's, it's writing to the church, those who have been sanctified and set apart by God, and those who have been genuinely saved. That's who he's talking to here. And then he also adds this. The next description is not only the sanctified, but he also puts another label on that that should be very comforting to you and I, and that is uh, the preserved, right? The preserved. This is important because of the theme of the book because he's, we're talking about uh, the assurance that we have when the apostasy would come. And so to be preserved, uh, this, uh, the rest of the letter paints a vivid picture about this apostasy that would come, but he gives us a little nugget right here in the introduction to give us some assurance in the face of apostasy throughout the letter. You can count it. You can count them. You, he uses the word keep. Four different times here in this letter, which which that's exactly what preserved means. It means to be kept. And so we are kept by his grace. We are kept in Jesus Christ. God is the one who keeps us. Even the things it says keep yourselves, it is a work of the Spirit of God and not our own that keeps us in God. That There is an assurance that no matter what the church does, no matter what the world does, doesn't matter what the church of God does, it doesn't matter what the church world as a whole, if they get, or they're cold, or they get off target or whatever, that God is able to keep those who are sanctified. And that, it does that bring you some assurance tonight to let you know, oh, everything that's going on in this world, what's the church going to do? Well, I, I know what the church is going to do. It won't be long. We're going to be leaving this world. Uh, those have, who have been called out, we're going to be called to leave this world to be with him. And so we are preserved. Thank God we are preserved. <coughs> Jude 121 says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Verse 24 says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. It gives us assurance even if we find ourselves in the dark days of the church. You know, we are living in a time, a dark time of apostasy now. Think about the church world as a whole, right? Not talking about Good Shepherd, amen. I, I pray that we're right in the middle of the book. I believe we are. And uh, But the church world as a day, there are many churches that preach from something else other than the Bible. There, there are many churches today that have went to what the word says that they would. They've turned to fables, right? They've turned to stories. And uh, many places are just kind of self-help clinics uh, that people go to. There's some that totally leave out some parts of the word. Some uh, churches have it just totally wrong. Uh, that's not, that is not, uh, um, uh, um, I'm not saying that in some kind of bad spirit, amen, but I just believe that what the word says, I just believe it just like it says that it is. And so, uh, and, and not every ministry, not every denomination, not every church is that way. I believe, I'll just go ahead and say this, I believe that anything less than a Pentecostal church is less than the truth. Amen, I believe that. Amen, I believe it's God's will for every believer. I believe there's supposed to be one church. If God's will would have worked it out, I believe there would have been one church and it would have been a Pentecostal church. That's my opinion. When you preach, you can preach your opinion. In a different pulpit problem. No, I'm just kidding. But we have seen an abandonment of the faith, haven't we? We've seen an abandonment of the faith that once was delivered to the saints. And uh, there are some denominations that 
if their their founders knew what was going on in their churches today, uh, somebody said the other day they would turn over in their grave. It's a terrible uh, where many churches have went and what they have changed from what the Word of God has declared to be so. Now, how is it going to get any worse? Is it going to how far? How much farther is it going to go uh, and, until the rapture of the church? We don't know, do we? How far it will go? But no matter what happens in the church as a whole, we can stand. He's going to keep us. He's going to preserve us and keep us. As long as we want to be kept, we're going to be kept and preserved by Almighty God. And, you know, I love John chapter 10. John chapter 10 talks about the good shepherd. It relates a relationship between the Lord and uh, you and I as his sheep. And uh, how many of you know that sheep aren't that smart? Sheep, uh, uh, sheep are, uh, let me see, they don't have any defense mechanisms. They're not fast runners. If something gets after them, they're not able to run faster than the predator. Uh, they don't have any claws. They don't have any fangs. They have nothing to defend themselves. The only thing that can defend the sheep is the shepherd. And that's how it is with you and I. If we're going to be kept. It will not be anything to do with ourselves, right? But it will be by God himself. He, in his sanctifying power, he is able to keep you and I, amen, just like the shepherd keeps the sheep. All of our defense is in God. It's, it is his covering. It's his armor that has been given to us, the armor of God, and it is his grace that will keep us uh, through it all. Our pers uh, preservation is all God and not ourselves. Our, our salvation, our salvation is based on the word of God and it's just a matter of you and I believing what it says or not. And so he says to the sanctified, to the pres preserved, and then it gives us one more label there who he's talking to and he said you're sanctified, you are preserved or kept you are called. He's writing to those who are called. That's you and I. And the, the word called here, as it is used in the scripture, is not only an invitation that is sent out, but it is an invitation that is sent out and accepted and made real by the Holy Ghost. That is the, the idea of calling. It's more than just a, an invitation going out, but the calling is an invitation going out, being received, and the Spirit of God making it real in our lives. Listen to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 22, 23, and 24. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach... Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Folks, if you have found Jesus Christ, uh, if you have found in Christ the wisdom of God and the power of God, and you have trusted in him, you are among those who are the called of God. I'm going to say that again. That scripture points it out. If you have found in Christ the wisdom of God, the power of God, and you have trusted in him, then you are the called of God. That the invitation is sent out, accepted, and believed, then they you are called. And that's kind of the that's kind of the introduction where he begins there. So look at verse two now. Took all that time just from verse 1. But look at verse 2. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. We need to recognize the difference between these three words here. Mercy, peace, and love not only to know the difference between them, but also to understand how they are connected. 
We know that love is an attribute of God, don't we? Because God is love, he is merciful, and he has provided grace. And so the love of God is toward, listen to these words, the love of God is toward the whole world. We all know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? And so it is not his will that any should perish. It's not God's will. There is an old teaching, Calvinism, that believes everyone was handpicked by God who would be saved and predetermined who would not be. Man, and so uh, and, and so that is a teaching of our day. But that would mean God had it in his mind, I will it that these would be saved, and it is my will that these would not be saved. The confusing things that we cannot comprehend in our own mind is this. There is a difference between predetermining something that it would be and knowing the outcome before it happens. Right? There is a difference between that. Mankind has a choice. Does the Spirit of God work on us and draw us to Christ? Yes. Does everybody that is drawn to Christ, do they accept the Lord? No. Unfortunately, they don't. That everyone, not everyone that God deals with, it is not God's will that anybody would perish. He's not trying to keep anybody out, but his will is that they would all come to repentance. And so God loves every human being. He does not have any favorites, right, anymore. He has no favorites. But, but not all humans are saved just because they are loved by God. Right? Some people think that, well, God loves me even though I'm a sinner, even though I've done this. Yeah, you're right. But we have to be saved, right? Because we can, uh, we can't, we can, uh, we, we can keep uh, ourselves from people can keep themselves from experiencing the love of God, but they can't keep themselves. Excuse me, I'll say that again. One can keep themselves from experiencing the love of God, but can't keep themselves from being loved by God. Right? He loves everybody, but there are some that are keeping themselves from experiencing the love of God. The peace of God is the experience. The peace of God is the experience that someone has when their heart has been trusting in Jesus Christ. Do you remember, I know some of you have been saved a long time, but do you remember uh, the condition of your mind or your soul before you came to Christ uh, the lack of peace that was there. I remember in my own life, I remember at times in my life, I was scared. There were times I was worried about going to sleep. There was times I can remember riding down the road hoping that that night would not be the night that Jesus would come back again. I didn't have the peace of God, but I remember the load that was lifted. When the first time I put my trust in Jesus Christ, I went home and and slept like a baby because I knew the peace of God had entered my life and you know the experience as well. The peace of God is that experience. Paul says it like this in Romans 5 and 1. Therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see there is the peace of God and there is peace with God. And I'll end with this tonight. The peace of God is having God's peace in our lives. We're living in it, right? We're, we can lay our head on our pillow at night knowing that it's going to be all right. Having the peace of God can be when everything, it seems like we're going through a storm in our life but we still have a peace about it, knowing that things aren't going exactly like I want them to go right now, but I have peace because I know I belong to him. I know he's watching over me. I know he's going to protect me. And whatever happens, he is in control of what takes place in my life. But the most important one, of course, is to have peace with God. Because when, before we come to Christ, the Bible says we were enemies of God. We were enemies. There was something that was in the way. There was a separation. Sin separated us 
uh, from God. And so there was a, there was contention. We were his enemies, but now the Bible says, but now we are his sons and his daughters. We are friends of God, right? And so we have been reconciled with the Lord. Thank God that we can have peace with God and also that we can live in the peace of God in our lives. And I'm thankful for the, the second verse there as we begin our study on this. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Amen. Stand with me if you would across this building and I, I want us to pray. I, I, my heart has been so stirred uh, among these uh, among this I, I don't know probably this month of May I have preached more this month and will preach more this month than I've preached in many years uh, whether it's here revival or uh, graduation stuff like that but God has stirred my heart about the condition of our world and what's coming right you say, you say pastor are you are you concerned? Well, uh, to a certain degree, I'm concerned, but I'm not concerned about Graham and, and my household. I'm not concerned about that because I know that God's in control and he's going to keep those. If, you, if, if you're serving the Lord and, and you're, you're living for him, wanting to please God, and your heart is towards him, friend, it doesn't matter what's going to happen. God's going to keep you. He's going to meet your needs. You're going to be okay. I don't know. Mo, I was reading something today. I think it was Sister Sandy that posted it. I hope that was not a, a proper post because they were saying it's going to get up the nine ga gas is going to get up to like eight or nine dollars a gallon. Lord have mercy. Basically broke out. We got a we got a Swin electric scooter. I may be riding that. I pull up to see y'all in the hospital. I pull up on my scooter. Take me a while to get there, but. But no, not just gas, but just what's going to happen in this world? What's going to go? What's going to go on? All right, five years ago, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have thought about some of the things that's happened in these last five years. And so, what is it moving forward? What's the what's the uh, condition of the church? You know, our our own denomination is going to be talking about some very very serious items on the the agenda of our general assembly in July. And uh, what will be the what will be the push for that? There in in multiple areas. I'll give you a report later, some other time, and let you know what's going on to, to get you to pray. But there's multiple areas that are going to be discussed, and there's a wing of the church that is allowing what the culture wants, uh, and and wanting to you know go and that be influenced by the culture, other than what does the Word of God say. Right, it's kind of like, um, you know, how we have what we call conservative Supreme Court justices, and we call some of them liberal. And the the conservative ones, they read the Constitution. They say it says this, and this is what they meant. Well, the liberals look at it and they kind of interpret it their own way and kind of compare it what today is, you know. And they're they're liberal with their interpretation of what it says. And some are conservative. Well, it's the same thing spiritually that's going on with the Word of God. And my, my fear is this. If we start bending now on what some things people say, well, it's not a major issue, but the excuse is, well, this is what culture is doing, this is what big business is doing, blah, blah, blah. We know what the Bible says, but now we're living in 22. What is the next thing going to be? You see the slippery slope that we can get into? And so... Uh, we'll be praying about that. But no matter what happens, right? No matter what happens there, the assembly of God, whoever else in this world, it doesn't matter. God's word still says what it says, and he's going to keep us. He's going to keep us right in the middle of his will, and the whole world can lose their mind. God's not losing his mind. And the word of God is going to stand forever. And as long as the church is on this planet, the Holy Ghost is going to be here. But there is coming a day. I believe it's very soon. I believe God's going to call his spirit out of this world. And everybody that the spirit of God is in their life, we're going with them. Amen. It won't be an airplane ride. Somebody said it's going to be a plane air ride. Amen. We're going to leave this world. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you, Lord. For giving us, Lord, and as we dig into it, just, just feed our souls with these things. 
But God, regardless of what happens in our families, in our community, in our denominations, in our world, in our country, no matter uh, if there's pandemics, if what, whatever, nat- uh, natural disasters, Lord, uh, whatever may come our way, spiritual storms, good, bad, mountaintops, valleys, it, the, whatever comes our way, God, I'm thankful that you have given us the assurance as long as we hold on to you, we're going to be all right. As long as we cling to you and stand on your word. But, Lord, I'm asking you to give us a fresh boldness to stand on the word of God that when we speak we would be able to speak the word of God and speak it with love and compassion and concern for everybody Lord that we wouldn't be lifted high on our uh, a horse of pride so to speak and and, and 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 our religiosity Lord and all of these things but Lord keep us humble but Lord keep us in the book Keep us right in the word, our leaders. God, oh, we don't want to compromise one inch to appease anything to give the devil a foothold. But, Lord, help us to stand as your word declares for us to stand. And, Lord, we're going to give you praise and glory and honor for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I wonder if tonight if you need a special prayer, if you would like to come and we'll pray for you.